Here is a circuit diagram I use in the beginning of many of my cardiovascular talks. However, for the topic of left heart failure, let's use this simpler circuit diagram, which illustrates how the circulatory system is a closed loop fluid system with four inline positive displacement pumps. The right atrium, the right ventricle, the left atrium, and the left ventricle. The left ventricle is the strongest pump and has the highest workload, since it needs to distribute oxygenated blood to tissues all over the body. This means that left ventricular pump failure may jeopardize every other organ system. The left ventricle is basically a thick-walled cone. We refer to the tip of this cone as the apex. The base of the cone is closed with two openings, an inlet that accepts fluid coming from the left atrium upstream, and an outlet through which fluid is propelled into the aorta downstream. Valves are present at both openings to prevent backflow. A two-leaflet mitral valve at the left ventricular chamber's upstream opening, and a three-leaflet aortic valve at its downstream opening. As a former engineer, it's a little easier for me to conceptualize the left ventricle as a more familiar variety of positive displacement pump, a piston pump. Using this analogy, during the downstroke, fluid from the left atrium flows across the mitral valve and into the left ventricular chamber. Instead of calling this the downstroke, medical folks like to refer to this part of the pump cycle as diastole. During the upstroke, Fluid in the left ventricular chamber flows across the aortic valve and into the aorta. Instead of referring to this as the upstroke, medical folks like to refer to this part of the cycle as systole. Stroke volume is the amount of fluid pumped out of the left ventricle during each downstroke, or systolic contraction of the left ventricle. Cardiac output, the volume of fluid pumped downstream by the left ventricle in a single minute, is simply the stroke volume multiplied by the heart rate, and usually expressed in liters per minute. Conditions where cardiac output is insufficient for the body's needs is referred to as heart failure. The most common causes of left-sided heart failure are long-term high blood pressure and coronary artery disease. However, problems with the mitral and aortic valves can also cause left ventricular heart failure. For example, with mitral valvular regurgitation, the left ventricle's stroke volume is partially squandered because some of the blood gets propelled into the left atrium instead of the aorta when the left ventricle contracts. With aortic valvular regurgitation, some of the blood the left ventricle propelled into the aorta is allowed to return into the left ventricle again instead of staying downstream. With aortic valvular stenosis, Resistance at the aortic valve impedes free forward flow of blood from the left ventricle into the aorta. When any of these five problems first emerge, particularly if the onset is gradual, the left ventricle can sometimes provisionally maintain cardiac output by compensating morphologically, either by undergoing wall thickening or chamber dilation. We refer to the former compensatory response as left ventricular hypertrophy, or LVH, and we refer to the latter compensatory response as left ventricular dilation. The ability of these compensatory morphological left ventricular changes is finite, however, and if the underlying root cause is not addressed, left ventricular heart failure may unfold. As it turns out, left ventricular hypertrophy tends to be the compensatory response we observe when the root cause is long-term systemic hypertension or aortic stenosis, and left ventricular dilation tends to be the compensatory response we observe when the root cause is coronary artery disease, mitral regurg, or aortic regurg. Let's look at the pathophysiology behind these compensatory changes, and when do we call them on a CT scan. Let's begin with concentric LVH in the setting of long-standing systemic hypertension or aortic valvular stenosis. From a hydraulics perspective, systemic hypertension and aortic valvular stenosis are similar 
in that they impede the left ventricle's attempts to pump blood downstream, either because the left ventricle has to pump against a higher than normal downstream fluid pressure head in the aorta, or the left ventricle has to pump through higher than normal downstream resistance at the aortic valve. The immediate consequence of either systemic hypertension or aortic valvular stenosis is increased pressure within the left ventricular chamber. If we refer to Laplace's law, increased pressure within a chamber, P, is directly associated with increased wall stress, T. The effort required for the myocardial wall to counteract this increased wall stress heightens oxygen demand and can increase the risk of a catastrophic ischemic event. The left ventricle's response is therefore to increase wall thickness, U, which lowers wall stress, T. There are a couple of consequences of this increased wall thickness or left ventricular hypertrophy, though. Wall thickening decreases chamber volume of the left ventricle, that is, preload is diminished. In terms of a piston pump, diminished preload in the setting of LVH means that the maximum displacement of our pump is now decreased, robbing us of stroke volume each cycle. The remodeling that occurs with LVH is also associated with fibrosis within the myocardial wall, which makes the left ventricular wall stiffer and the left ventricular chamber more difficult to fill. Decreased preload and increased wall stiffness, side effects of LVH, can eventually trump whatever gains we initially derived by increasing wall thickness and lead to left ventricular heart failure. Since the immediate cause of left ventricular heart failure is due to diminished preload and difficulty filling the left ventricular chamber, during the diastolic phase of the cardiac cycle, we refer to this situation as diastolic heart failure or heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. There are other downstream consequences of LVH. For example, if the elevator chamber pressures in the left ventricle are transmitted upstream into the left atrium, the left atrium will enlarge. Stretching the left atrial wall can damage the conduction fibers in the left atrial wall and lead to arrhythmias such as atrial fibrillation. So, how do we recognize LVH on CT imaging? We usually rely on measurements of left ventricular wall thickness, a direct sign of LVH, and measurements of left atrial volume, an indirect sign of LVH. Left ventricular hypertrophy can be diagnosed by measuring abnormally increased interventricular septal wall thickness or posterior left ventricular wall thickness on end diastolic CT images. Separate reference values for left ventricular wall thickness exist for women and for men, and different threshold values are used for mild, moderate, and severe LVH. It can be tough to remember all of these numbers in daily practice, so I focus on just trying to remember 10 millimeters as a rough upper threshold for normal LV wall thickness for women and for men, which is pretty easy um, to remember. This method can be potentially easy and fast to perform, but it may not always be practical since the CT images a radiologist is reviewing may not necessarily be end diastolic images, and not everyone may necessarily remember or have ready access to what these size thresholds are. Left ventricular hypertrophy may be inferred by measuring left atrial enlargement. Traditionally, this was done by measuring the anteroposterior diameter of the left atrium at the level of the aortic root and comparing that measurement to separate reference values and thresholds for women and for men. While fairly easy to do, this requires a knowledge of what the reference values and thresholds are. In addition, it was also discovered that the AP diameter of the left atrium is not a reliable indicator of left atrial enlargement, particularly if it isn't normalized to patient age or body surface area. Some folks have advocated using a transverse left atrial diameter over 73 millimeters as a threshold for left atrial enlargement, but this has not been fully validated. Looking at what's out there in the literature, 
it seems that measuring the cross-sectional area of the left atrium at the level of the left ventricular outflow tract and seeing if it exceeds 2,000 square millimeters may be the most pragmatic and accurate method currently out there for recognizing left atrial enlargement in our busy daily CT reading practice. Tools for drawing a polygon or irregular shape and calculating its area exist on most PAX platforms today, and 2,000 is a pretty easy number to remember. Now, let's move on to left ventricular dilation in the setting of coronary artery disease, mitral valvular regurge, or aortic valvular regurge. With myocardial ischemia, the left ventricle's ability to contract is compromised, leading to decreased stroke volume. With mitral valvular regurgitation, some of the blood ejected by the left ventricle is allowed to go backstream into the left atrium rather than downstream into the aorta. And with aortic valvular regurgitation, some of the blood ejected by the left ventricle into the aorta is allowed to return backstream into the left ventricle again. If any of these three conditions threatens to compromise cardiac output, cardiac output can be provisionally maintained by either increasing heart rate, which comes at the cost of heightened oxygen demand and increased risk of a catastrophic ischemic event, or by increasing stroke volume. As it turns out, when the left ventricle dilates, the individual cardiac myocytes in the left ventricular wall get stretched, which increases sarcomere length. Increased sarcomere length results in increased force generation due to a basic property of skeletal um, or cardiac muscle called length-dependent activation. Basically, as sarcomere length increases, the calcium sensitivity of troponin rises, which increases the amount of tension developed by a muscle fiber. This can help compensate for cardiac output lost by valvular regurgitation or myocardial ischemia. However, as with left ventricular hypertrophy, left ventricular dilation does not come without some unwanted side effects. If we turn again to Laplace's law, increased chamber dilation, or R, is directly associated with increased wall stress, T. Additional effort must be exerted by the myocardial wall to counteract this increased wall stress, which heightens oxygen demand. Increased oxygen demand increases the risk of a catastrophic ischemic event and can also be associated with restricted left ventricular contractility. If the response to decreased left ventricular contractility is another round of left ventricular dilation and sarcomere stretching as before, a vicious cycle leading to worsening left ventricular heart failure unfolds. Since the immediate cause of left ventricular failure in this scenario is insuffic insufficient contractility or downstream propulsion of blood during systole, we refer to this situation as systolic heart failure or heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. So, how do we recognize left ventricular dilation on CT imaging? We usually rely on measurements of left ventricular volume. Left ventricular volume can be estimated by measuring the inner diameter of the left ventricular chamber at end diastole. However, due to the shape and orientation of the left ventricle, measurements in a standard axial CT plane can be inaccurate, and the actual measurement needs to be done in a special plane we refer to as the two-chamber view. The two-chamber view is a long axis view through the left heart chambers that only displays the left atrium and left ventricle. Creating it requires a 3D workstation, as you can see in this demonstration. The inner diameter of the left ventricular chamber is measured at end diastole and compared to these reference values for men and for women. Objectively calling left ventricular enlargement on CT imaging is challenging, since the images being reviewed may not necessarily be at end diastole. Even if end diastolic images are provided, it's a time-consuming process that requires a 3D workstation and a familiarity with how to achieve a proper two-chamber view of the heart on the workstation and the 
knowledge of what the threshold values are for a normal versus enlarged left ventricle. So at the end of the day, why is all this uh, knowledge important? The morphological changes associated with left ventricular remodeling, left ventricular hypertrophy, left ventricular enlargement, and left atrial enlargement portend left heart failure. Some of these morphologic changes may be initially reversible, which means that early detection could lead to early treatment of the root cause and preventing the development of left heart failure and its complications. Left ventricular hypertrophy and left ventricular dilation are also independent predictors for cardiovascular morbidity and death, and therefore an important flag for patients and their healthcare providers to recognize.